joining us on the Boardwalk on the Hotline from Crossing Broad. He told me off the air he's zoomed out with all these Sixers Zoom calls. Also, we'll talk a little MLS because what do the MLS and the NBA have in common? Well, they're actually going to get a season started. Unlike baseball right now, we can't get it out of their own way. Kevin joins us, as I said, on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. Kevin, how are you doing today? Josh, what's going on, man? How you been? I'm doing pretty good. So before we get to anything else, is it just me or is it completely exasperating that every other sport can figure out how to do this testing, but baseball walks up to the start line with their shoes untied and they've already tripped and fell on their face? <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's, uh, it's ironic, too, because... You know, we sat here, you know, last week, the week before, the week before that, wondering if there was going to even be baseball this year and thinking that they were so far behind. And now the players are out there practicing and uh, we don't have uh, the testing results in time. It's like we it's like we put baseball in a uh, in a time warp and went from no baseball at all. to now we're like too far in front of ourselves and we're, we're tripping over our own shoelaces. And I think it's interesting because. I get it that not every sport has gotten 100% right, and one of them is a sport that's going to start this week, the first official team sport in America that actually makes money. That's the caveat I'm making because I know the Women's Soccer League started about two weeks ago. But the MLS is starting this week, and listen, they fumbled a little bit getting out of the gate, but they kind of adjusted and figured things out. Yeah, and look, I think – I think everybody has to take a step back here and understand that n- nobody was going to get this perfect. And no league was, was going to get this perfect. We, we've never done this before. We've never navigated a global pandemic before. This is our, the first global pandemic of our lifetimes, you know. And, uh, you know, you can point at every league having a different issue. You know, you mentioned the, the women's league, NWSL, played a, a tournament out in Utah. And the Orlando team had to skip out of it entirely because they had a bunch of positive tests because a bunch of the younger players, I guess, went out partying or something like that. Um, the Dallas team in MLS had a bunch of positives. And so their opening round game, which I think was scheduled for Thursday or Friday, that was postponed and pushed back. Um, you know, individually, you have NBA players, WNBA players who are opting out. You know, we have the issues with the testing and baseball and, you know, the Nationals today, you know, canceling their their training because they don't have their test back from Friday. So people, people have to understand. I think people got to understand that this was always going to be the case that we were always going to have hiccups here and we were going to forge ahead with it no matter what, you know, the idea, it was never, we were never going down there and doing this under the guise that everybody was going to be a hundred percent and we'd have zero positive cases and everything was going to be flawless. And, uh, you know, reasonably enough, you know, our local team, the union, didn't have any cases. They had one guy who, who had COVID in March and is recovered and is fine. And they got down there with no problems. And it seems like they're looking forward to playing on Thursday morning. So, you know, it's, it's either, I think people just got to understand this was, this was never going to be a case of like, everybody's completely healthy. Let's go. You know, there's always going to be caveats and, and asterisks that we are adding on to it. Right. And, but part of the problem is that the whole world is under an asterisk. So who, who am I to say that one asterisk is more, Serious another. By the way, for those who do care, MLS uh, MLS MVP Carlos Vela has opted out of the return. So, um, yeah, Kevin, what yeah, is, what is what? Well, but what does that mean though? Like you know, for for those out there who like I said earlier, like my knowledge of soccer is I played for a few years in high school because I went to a high school without a football team. So my <laughs> knowledge of soccer is I played it and I can watch a game. And I know what's going on. Not like I know every single player in the MLS. So if you could explain to people like me in the audience out there, what does the loss of the MLS MVP mean for the return of MLS? Well, I mean, just from a legitimacy standpoint, you know, if you told me straight up that like LeBron James or, or Giannis wasn't going to play in the NBA return at the end of this month, you know, we'd all say, well, it's a scam. You know, it doesn't mean anything, you know, because the best player in the league is not going to be there. So it's, it's illegitimate, you know, whoever gets crowned the winner or whoever wins the golden boot for most goals scored or something like that, because Carlos Vela scored a bazillion goals last year. And he's by far the best attacking player in the league. He's a winger forward striker. But, uh, you know, from a, from a soccer perspective, it doesn't mean as much. I mean, look, there's 11 guys on the field and, uh, you know, the individual impact of like a Lionel Messi or a Cristiano Ronaldo is not the same as, you know, 
pick basketball where you got five guys on the floor and one of them is Giannis. You know, the individual contributions of an MVP are, are greater in basketball or if your MVP is uh, 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 Tom Brady or somebody like that or a goalkeeper in, in the NHL. You know, the individual contributions of soccer players are not the same as they are in other sports. But just the legitimacy of saying, hey, we're playing a tournament without our best player. You know, what does it really mean? Even if the, if the union went down there and won the whole thing and they beat LAFC, who Vela plays for in the final, then everybody's going to say, well, they didn't beat Vela. You know? Kevin Kincaid joining us here on the Bowl. Welcome kind of hotline on 97.3 ESV. Make sure to follow me here at Kevin underscore Kincaid, crossing broad, follows the MLS, also covering the Sixers. And speaking of the Sixers, let's switch it over to the NBA right now, Kevin, and that is... I'm very curious to see what exactly happens with this return because of one specific thing. I'm slowly coming to grips with the reality that literally everything that we thought about the NBA before the shutdown happened is probably just going to be null and void because everyone is literally coming in with a four-month off, off-season clean slate into this bubble where pretty much everyone, unless you're the Brooklyn Nets, are on the same page, basically. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think that we all kind of agreed uh, that the teams that had something to play for would take this seriously and would go into it with motivation, and the teams that didn't really have anything to play for, any motivation, would just kind of whatever. You know, got a couple Brooklyn Nets who they're probably not going to win at all, so some of those guys are sitting out. Trevor Rees already has a ring. Uh, Dabs Bertans is going to be a free agent, and he's not going to win a ring this year. So is he going to go down there and risk getting himself COVID or, you know, hurting his his knee or something like that? Of course not. You know, but the good thing is that for Philadelphia sports fans, the Sixers seem like they're interested in going down there and playing, and everybody seems to be on the same page. And what we're hearing on these numerous uh, Zoom calls that I can't get enough of are. Uh, <laughs> people saying and doing the right things that they want to go down there to play, go down there to win. They're locked in. You know, everybody's uh, looking forward to kind of, kind of proving that the beginning of the season was, was not what this team is. Uh, so I think that's how it is. That's how it's going to be for, for NBA, MLS, you know, baseball. I think you're going to have a, a set of guys who are like interested and motivated and others that aren't, you know, so you take the groups that are interested and motivated and you say, Put them in a vacuum, no home court advantage, no road court disadvantage, no fans, no external factors. Everybody goes into the vacuum, and we're just going to see who wants it more, you know? Now, speaking of who wants it more, I know that the Sixers are becoming a, a popular dark horse pick for a lot of people around the media. But, Kevin, my question for you is, this is a Sixers team that we know was built with one idea in mind, which was they were going to be able to match up, in theory, with the Bucks and potentially – beat them in a series. So is them playing defense at the end of the day going to be the thing that makes or breaks the Sixers playoff run? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, cause they're not going to shoot their way to a title. <laughs> I think we know that, you know, <laughs> they're not going to you know, three point shoot their way to a title. So I, and I think, I think, I think the, the, the bigger point here, Josh is like, we had always said, uh, you know, we got us. This team is built for the playoffs. This team is built for the playoffs. I mean, how many times did we tell ourselves that? You know, they're tall, they're big, they're long, they're lean. You know, they they were built to lock down teams uh, defensively with Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid patrolling the paint and Al Horford hopefully coming in, being able to to spell Joel Embiid's minutes. I mean, everybody remembers how great the Sixers were with Embiid on the floor defensively last year, and then when he came off, wasn't Greg Monroe like a negative nine in in two minutes or something like that? So. Yeah. Um, that was always that was always what it was going to be, and it would be it would be you know all these people want to come out with these uh, allow me to editorialize quickly. All these people come out and they say, well, cancel sports. We don't need this. We don't need that or whatever. Well, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. It's your opinion, but you know this Sixers team, the season would be totally incomplete unless we actually got a chance to see uh, if the way this team was constructed worked in the playoffs, you know, because that's what they built it for. You know, it was not built to be a regular season team. It was built to get them into the playoffs and then compete in the playoffs. So. I want to see what happens when they finally get to that point. Like I, like I said, the last time you and I did this, and this is probably the best opportunity that Brett Brown is going to have to take a healthy team into the playoffs ever. Now, you mentioned a healthy team. We've heard about Joel and Ben and how great and healthy and in shape they are. We've all seen the pictures of uh, Ben Simmons looking like he's uh, put on about probably a little bit more muscle than anybody expected him to put on about a two-month period. But mm-hmm. what can we actually expect from a team 
coming off of a break like this because in many ways, as I said earlier, this is basically like a mini offseason. We know how much guys improve from one season to the next. Well, it's been about four months. So what what is an actual fair expectation for these guys coming back? Well, first of all, physically, you're going to see guys have a little bit more muscle packed on because, uh, you know, as you go through the season, um, you're not lifting as many weights. You know, you're doing a lot of cardio and you're going to start cutting weight naturally. You know, it's like you got to gain 10 pounds during quarantine because I haven't played soccer in four months. <laughs> you know, so then when, he, when these guys, when Ben Simmons starts getting back to the, the routine, you know, he can put muscle on at the beginning of the season, but he's going to start to shed a little bit of that because as many minutes as he plays during the year, as much running as he does naturally, your cardio, you start to burn things and you become leaner. You know, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing we can expect is just to hit the reset button, really. You know, I, everybody, I think, kind of forgets that, uh, you know, right before the, the stoppage, uh, Ben was injured. But a couple games before that, Al Horford had come out of the starting lineup, and they were trying different starting lineups, and they were there was this admission that the Al horford Joel Bead bone bead thing might not work. So that's one thing they're going to have to navigate. Number two is Shake Milton, your backup ball handler. You're going to try to play an off, off ball with Ben Simmons handling the ball. You know, so they still have, they might be in great physical shape. You know, they might be saying all the all the, the right things, but, uh, you know, they're still, you know, strategical and tactical kinks to work out here, wondering if, uh, you know, if, if Brett Brown can put the pieces together. Now, I'm going to pitch you my theory, and you can either shoot it down or give me the thumbs up. Okay, Kevin? Okay. So my theory is the Sixers starting lineup should be Shake Milton, Matisse Thibel, Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons, and Bede for this reason. We know the Sixers don't have a very good offense, but if you can go out there and play elite defense, shut down or at least slow down the other team's starting unit, then come off the bench with some scorers, it actually could neutralize some of the other high-scoring teams because you're basically throwing guys like Thibel and Milton out there against guys like Eric Bledsoe, Kemba Walker, and others, instead of hoping that Ben and Tobias have to do all that work with against the starting unit. Thoughts? Well, I like it. It's interesting. I would just swap out Matisse Thibel for Josh Richardson, you know, because Josh Richardson's going to give you... Josh Richardson's a really good defensive player, too, when he's healthy. I think everybody forgets that he was dealing with a hamstring, too, uh, but he can give you better scoring than Matisse. So, I, you know, I, I think you know, the path that you're trying to go down, if you think that Al Horford, if, if, if anybody's in the family of Al Horford should come off the bench, then your starting lineup will be Ben Simmons at the one, Shake Milton at the two. Josh Richardson goes down to the three. Tobias Harris plays power forward and Joel Embiid. You know, that's the way you would get shaken there and just basically just replace Horford with Shake Milton and then move everybody down a spot. You know, defensively, that might not be as, as stout, but you get more offense off of that. You know, the question really is, is you know, what can, can Shake Milton exist? in an off ball role with Ben Simmons handling the ball, because I think everybody forgets that when Jake went on his big run right before the shutdown, you know, he was the point guard and he had the ball in his hands. Uh, and there's not a lot of evidence. I, I think yeah, I got to go look at the numbers again, but there weren't a ton of minutes shared where they were both on the floor at the same time. So I like your theory. I would just, uh, you know, if you were going to do it, I'd probably just have Josh Richardson in there. Now, if I can just play a little devil's advocate with you, is it really that, about Shake playing with Ben or is it about Ben playing with Shake Milton? Because we know that the original theory is that Ben was supposed to be the quote unquote point guard, but haven't we seen the majority of success by teams in this league that they have multiple ball handlers? Like you can go through the list of teams in the league. They all have multiple ball handlers. So isn't some of this on Ben to adjust to the idea that he might not be the only guy bringing the ball up the court? Yeah, well, I mean, it depends on how much you believe in Ben as a uh, power forward or as a screener. You know, how do you want to use him? Do you want to run? Do you want to play pick and roll with him? Do you want to use him as a as a roller? Uh, you know, because it's the issue has always been the issue has never been uh, you know having a ball handling. Like obviously, you'd love to have both of those guys on the court together, but you know, oftentimes you've shown that you can't. Well, where do you put Ben when he's when he doesn't have the ball? You know, they stick him in the dunker spot. They put him weak side under the rim can't space him out of the corner because he's not a three point shooter. Uh, you know, he can't really sort of hover there around the elbow. You can use him in a Al Horford role and have him pass, but you know, either I do believe in him as a screener and a roller there, or, uh, you know, you stick him under the basket because his offensive game, off ball game hasn't, hasn't evolved to the point where, uh, 
you know, you can kind of stick him out on the wing or put him in the corners or uh, make him an open shooting threat. So I think everybody loves the idea of having those two guys on the floor together, but it's, it's more about the, the way to do it, I think, would be to have Ben with the ball in his hands and then Shake Milton would have to sort of, sort of find his shots without the ball in his hand, and that's probably the best way you would do it. Well, I ran, I, I ran the numbers before the weekend, and I noticed this, and you can steal this if you want for uh, something for Crossing Broad, Kevin, but from okay. Jan- January 22nd to March 11th, the frame when Shake Milton was actually playing every day, before that he barely played at all, but during that stretch he was shooting 51% from three, so it's not like he's incapable mm. of playing off the ball. I think people just assume that he is or isn't because his name isn't, you know, J.J. Redick, Furkan Korkmaz, people assume that he can't be a floor spreader when actually the numbers show that he can. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. You just have to go, you, you'd have to dive a little bit deeper into, you know, film study and say, you know, how are they using him? You know, how is he taking his shots? Were they catch and shoot? Was he pulling up from, from three point? Were they running pick and roll with him? You know, you'd have to do a little bit more of a, of a concerted dive there and see, you know, here's how he was scoring. Can we replicate that with Ben Simmons on the floor. Yeah, maybe it can, maybe it can. It's hard to say because, uh, you know, we, we can't magically predict how defenses would uh, respond seeing both of those guys at the same time. You know, maybe if they're both on the floor and the ball is in Shake's hands and Ben Simmons is standing under the basket or in the corner or something like that, they just uh, send a help defender off of Ben Simmons. They said they sent Ben's guy to address Shake or somebody else and then maybe it doesn't work. But um, it's a good story idea, actually. Maybe that's something I dive into <laughs> as we get as we get closer. You know, pull some video clips and do some uh, do something about actual basketball again. You know, a- absolutely. All right, Kevin. Before I let you go, the most important question of our conversation I'm going to ask you right here, and that is, which Philly team is going to go deeper in their respective postseason, the Sixers or the Union? Sixers or the Union? Let me see. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the union's chances just because of the things that they're saying. And also because their tournament is like a, uh, it's, it's kind of like a bracket um, for, it's kind of like a, like group play into a knockout bracket. It's kind of like world cup style. And I like them to get out of their group. Uh, so it's hard to compare the two, but um, I say they both go about the same distance. I think the Sixers can easily make it to the finals. I don't think they would beat the bucks in the Eastern conference finals. Uh, I think the union can go to the semifinals and uh, I'll answer that by just uh, dodging the question and say, they'll both go the same, <laughs> the same, the same distance in their respective <laughs> tournament. Would you like me to check back with you in two weeks? How about that? <laughs> yeah. If I'm, if I'm correct, then we'll pull the audio. And if I'm incorrect, then we'll just pretend I never said it. Oh, that? absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, we'll just make it like it didn't happen. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know what I said two weeks ago. It doesn't count. I mean, you know, I was I was jumping from Zoom call to Zoom call. I don't remember what day it is. That's right. That's a good excuse. And uh, if it comes down to that, then we'll just, we'll just pull that one out of the hat. <laughs> He's Kevin Kincaid. Follow him on Twitter at Kevin underscore Kincaid. Crossing broad, covering the Sixers and the Union and more over there. Again, at Kevin underscore Kincaid on Twitter. Kevin, appreciate your time on a Monday and uh, – do, do, do your best with those Zoom calls to stay awake, okay? I will, man. We got two more later today, so by the end of the day, I'll be uh, I'll be Zoomed out. Well, good luck. We're all counting on you. <laughs> all right, man. See you.